I'm Louis Perna, Chief Scientist and a co-founder of Axion Systems, a provider of in-space propulsion. I'll be discussing electropropulsion for small satellites and the important considerations to make outside of the primary technical factors that usually first come to mind when making design choices. These considerations have impacts on the satellite system level and more critically at the operational, program, financial, and industry level. Our industry is more active than ever, with more and more satellites launching. By 2025, it is predicted that around 1,100 will launch every year. And for every one of these that intends to deliver commercial, scientific, or defense value, a propulsion solution will be needed. From near-term, near-Earth applications like communication, observation, and navigation, to far-term, far-out ideas like hotels, mining, and human exploration and settlement. And as with everything, we expect more and more capability from our space systems with each passing year. For small satellites, the Delta V requirements can span several orders of magnitude depending heavily on the mission goals and potential regulations made to preserve the environment. And the same thing that drives the industry towards small sat architectures drives us to do more with less mass, volume, power, and cost in every system. Electric propulsion is all about doing more with less. The rocket equation tells us that the propellant mass required for the Delta V capability reduces exponentially with increasing specific impulse, a measure of how effectively each bit of propellant translates to maneuvering capability. Electric propulsion has a higher specific impulse than traditional chemical rocket technologies. EP provides more impulse for the same or less propellant, so launch costs for a satellite can come down and payload resources can go up. Today, more than ever, there are electric propulsion options available to small sats. The selection space for thrust and specific impulse is not overly limited, and system designers can narrow it with those and other top-of-mind considerations. Some technologies can be eliminated immediately based on requiring too much power or volume for any reasonable small sat. But after that, finding the best option can be difficult. Sometimes it's because the options are too similar, too unknown, or the preferred satellite design sits in an apparent chasm between commercially available options. Stepping up to the operational, program, and industry level, there are key considerations to make, many of which are no doubt familiar to system designers, program managers, business owners, and defense strategists. The impact that electric propulsion has at these levels can make or break its applicability. SmallSat operation in LEO is complex due to constrained power resources and often small windows of opportunity to accomplish a mission. An ideal propulsion system is ready at a moment's notice, can operate at a power level that matches available resources, doesn't require other systems to shut off, doesn't cause communications blackouts, and doesn't generate so much heat that it must be used intermittently. Scheduling for warm-up periods, reorientations, recharges, and so on not only increases labor costs for the operator, it may drive a mission to need more satellites or more time. All of these operational complexities arise because the entire purpose of a satellite is to derive value from the payload operation, whether that value is monetary, scientific, or for defense. Constraining the time and power resources available to the payload, data handling, and communication systems jeopardizes or directly reduces the potential to derive value. Return on investment should be maximized through the selection of the propulsion solution. Discussing the bottom line further, doing more with less always includes lowering upfront and operational costs. Often overlooked is the increased cost of selecting a propulsion system that includes hazards to people, hardware, and the environment. If propellant loading requires specially trained personnel, additional equipment, or asking non-essential personnel to take the day off, hidden costs can be high. That's not to mention the insurance implications for all parties involved, including the launch vehicle. Ideally, a system would be delivered fully loaded and completely safe. Design and implementation costs can grow if the performance levels or thermal burden of available propulsion solutions don't line up with the desired minimum scale of the satellite. This pushes the whole satellite design to a larger bus size causing an engineering domino effect and higher launch costs. Ideally, a propulsion technology can be scaled to meet the satellite's needs at any size, not the other way around. Single point failure components in a propulsion system increase the risk of mission loss. Accounting for this risk can lead to more margin in the number of systems launched and or allocation for more replacement launches over the long term. Ideally, a propulsion technology has fault tolerance, so capability is maintained with the initial investment. 
Guaranteeing long-term operation and viability for a system and for all operators requires a hard look at how systems fail. The space debris problem grows at a faster rate than the rate at which we launch systems. A single point component failure risk not only means designers must plan for more margin in their satellite count and for higher replenishment rates, it means a valuable asset can become a risk to all satellites in its path due to the loss of collision avoidance or deorbit capability. Even worse, untrackable debris as small as a millimeter poses a risk of rupturing the high pressure propellant vessels of some technologies, creating a debris cloud that propagates the collision risk for all operators. This is the type of scenario where predictive collision avoidance is nigh impossible. Ideally, a propulsion solution degrades gracefully in the face of component failures and doesn't contain a permanent source of bomb-like potential energy. When there are too many options in contention, taking these considerations into account can immediately narrow the solution space. When there are none left in the solution space, then it's time to consider what technology can fill the apparent gap. Now I'll briefly review most of the EP technologies available today for small satellites and highlight where the aforementioned considerations arise. First, I'll talk about gas phase plasma technologies, starting with Hall thrusters. This technology is highly developed and has been flown in space to a great degree, bringing along high thrust to power. At the smallest scales, Hall thrusters lose efficiency and generate more heat. Igniting the plasma takes a fairly high baseline level of power. Like other noble gas systems, they have high pressure tanks and can become non-operational when the cathode fails. Additionally, the ionization mechanism and plasma beam may overlap with the intended communication frequencies. Gridded ion engines have a lot in common with Hall thrusters, though the higher thrust levels are traded for better propellant efficiency. Communications issues should be a bit lower, but the thruster head volume is higher for the same thrust. Ambipolar thrusters are newer in development, but they eliminate the cathode failure risk and can get high thrust levels for their size. Unfortunately, demonstrated power efficiency and specific impulse have been low. The amount of heat generated during their operation can mean only intermittent use is possible to prevent propulsion or satellite issues or failures. The high pressure risk of Hall, gridded ion, and ambipolar thrusters is addressed with a switch to propellants which solidify or liquefy at low pressures. For the most part, these solutions are newly viable with only some options demonstrating good results. Pulse plasma thrusters and vacuum arc thrusters are cheap and electromechanically simple. Their biggest downside is the low efficiency and extremely low thrust derived from the input power. This has limited their in-space use. Avoiding broadband communications interference and electromagnetic shutdown of computers requires careful design, test, and operation. Thrusters utilizing ion emission from liquid metals take us away from true plasmas and come with some important benefits to small satellites. This technology is inherently microscale, so small devices can be built. They have high specific impulse and importantly, use a propellant stored without pressurization, eliminating a large risk factor on the ground and in space. The downside to metal ion emission is that scaling to high thrust requires power levels that can be difficult to handle on small satellites. Additionally, Melting the solid metal propellant imposes power and timing penalties operationally. Also, the cathode risk makes a reappearance here. Ion electrospray thrusters share much in common with liquid metal FEEP, but the propellant is an ionic liquid, which lowers the power required to achieve a given thrust level and enables positive and negative ion emission, so the cathode again disappears. Ionic liquids also don't need to be stored under pressure, but they can be selected or designed to remain liquid at flight temperatures, so there isn't any need to plan or power ahead of firing the thruster. Thrust is available at a moment's notice. As the newest technology to see concentrated development, the limitations with electrospray are in heritage and the number of systems reliably demonstrating high impulse throughput. Since ion electrospray is unfamiliar to most people, is my favorite propulsion technology, and is the one Axion provides, what can I say, I'm biased. I'll dive into how it works. The geometry is an emitter structure opposite an electrode with an aperture. A conductive propellant at the emitter is put at high voltage compared to the electrode. The electric forces on the liquid cause it to deform until ions are evaporated 
and accelerated as a beam, producing thrust. Switching the polarity of the voltage switches the polarity of the beam. Operating a positive and a negative thruster in parallel for balanced charge output is what makes the cathode unnecessary. This emission is happening at the scale of the liquid molecules. More emitters directly scales the technology up to bigger systems. Axion's solution to propulsion is to microfabricate this technology. We build components using tools from the microchip industry and pair them with proprietary materials and processes to produce thruster chips with tailored propulsive performance. By packing more emitters into current and future architectures, ion electrospray thrusters conceivably surpass the performance density of all flight tested EP options to date. We are tessellating these thruster chips onto the face of our product. This combination of compact modular thruster chips, low to zero pressure propellant supplies, and a cathodeless fault tolerant propulsion technology brings the low power flexibility and capability that small satellites need. And given that we're only at the beginning of the performance density curve, the possibilities are immense. I'll now talk about a couple of cases where the secondary considerations discussed earlier arise and give comparisons to show how ion electrospray can improve the situation. First, let's consider a microsatellite constellation doing something like Earth observation. The more time and power spent using the imaging system, processing the images, and transmitting them to the ground, the more value each satellite provides. So the solution is high thrust for a given power. Comparing the thrust and power of a competitor and Axion's upcoming Tile 4 product, the ion electrospray system not only allows more power budget to other systems, it also performs maneuvers in shorter times. This means less time spent thrusting, so imaging can be done instead, but also the possibility of working on image processing, downlinking, or even imaging while firing. For reasonable example mission parameters, this could mean something like 12% more imaging value returned, whether that's value in dollars or value in image content. Along a different line, I'll discuss the risk that mega constellations have brought to the forefront. With tens of thousands of communication satellites being placed in orbit, the absolute number of collisions every year with existing debris has grown and will grow. Satellites with supercritical noble gases stored on board have a high risk of debris damaging the tank and leading to catastrophic rupture comparable to a moderate amount of TNT going off. An event like this for a single satellite would be rare, but with so many satellites, the probability of just one is not low, and the chain reaction grows quickly out of hand. It's possible that within just a few years of the first event, entire swaths of LEO will be practically unusable for millennia. Changing to a low to zero pressure system like Tile 4 removes the explosion risk, and with inherent modularity, an impact is not necessarily crippling to the full propulsion system, allowing potential for de-risking maneuvers. Hopefully this overview of the less obvious, not advertised implications of today's SmallSat EP technologies has been helpful in understanding the landscape and what your future possibilities can be when looking to make the best choice. Technology advancement has made these options possible in recent years, and my hope is that further advancement will make space an easier and safer place to operate and work. We're always going to want to push the boundaries of what can be done and how much it takes to do it. Thank you for your time.